welcome to episode 50 of the Camerosity Podcast. I cannot believe I am saying it, but wow, who would have thought that something that started out as cocaine and waffles would make it this far? My name is Mike Ekman, and with me as always are Anthony Rue, Paul Reibel, Theo Panagopoulos, and Johnny Sit. Wait what? a minute, Johnny? Oh. What? <laughs> is that really you? How the heck have you been? Hey, everybody. Pretty good, He's thanks. Back. <laughs> Enjoying podcast retirement. <laughs> podcast retirement. Talk about it. Yeah. Wow. It's been a long time. I think we were just saying uh, it was episode four was the last time you were on. I've shared the story multiple times about how this started. One night, Johnny and I literally said, hey, let's do a podcast tonight. And uh, with less than an hour's warning, I just sent out a bunch of messages through Facebook and said, hey, we're doing a podcast. Let's record one. So uh, that's kind of how it got started, and, and we're still going. So 50 episodes, it's crazy. That is crazy. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, thank you. What was it like, you know, with, with uh, Classic Lenses podcast at the 50th episode? Did you guys feel like you had made it by that point? I don't, even, kind of... I don't even remember it. <laughs> it's a distant memory? Yeah, I don't even remember. They all, they all kind of blur together, more or less. Yeah. Except for a few, there's a few standouts for sure. And, and you know, a few things, a few really good memories really stand out. But yeah. It's it's a it's a blur. <laughs> Hopefully, it was the Mr. Rodoloni's episode was one of the standout ones, right? It absolutely. I mean, in all seriousness, I'm not kissing Bob's ass here. In all seriousness, that was one of the. That was fairly early on, and I feel like yeah. that was what. Yeah, it I was feel 51. Like was, it was okay. episode 51. So I feel like that was one of the episodes that was like we felt like, wow, this is really a thing. This, I mean, to get to talk to Bob about all this stuff, it felt like a really, it felt like a, a milestone. Yeah. I, I really mean that, Bob. It, it really, right. it really did. And it was, a, it was just an amazing conversation. And I think, I think about the conversations with Vlad also, and, you know, there's a few that just really stand out, but that, that's certainly very high on the list. I think of our best favorite, yeah. you know, most interesting episodes is certainly that one. And it's crazy for me too, because- I think to all the people I've talked to, you know, each of you guys here, I mean, I met you guys either through a podcast or yeah. through the website, you know, I mean, Johnny, I met you at Central Camera because you're close by. Bob, you live five minutes from here. Anthony, I probably would have never really met you if you hadn't been on Classic Lenses podcast because that's how I got introduced. I to thought you. Cheyenne introduced you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheyenne introduces everybody. <laughs> That's an inside joke where Cheyenne takes credit for everybody meeting. We've had Cheyenne on a couple episodes and uh, he's always a hoot to talk to. Yes, he is. <laughs> well, um, I guess we'll just get going. You know, this is our 50th anniversary, 50th show, whatever. Maybe we'll do 50 more. Maybe we won't. You know, one rule I've always said to the guys is we're going to do this for as long as it's fun. And uh, so far, it's still been fun. You know, we've we've had some amazing guests on the show. The the model that we have compared to certain other podcasts allow people to come back more than once. You know, we'll have re recurring people. Sometimes co people come on multiple times. Bob, you've been on quite a few. Uh, Mark Faulkner is a regular person we've had. And uh, it's really cool to just kind of catch up with people. And, you know, people can kind of give us updates on things that they've been doing. Um, on the Facebook group, we hear a lot of, why don't you guys do an episode about this format or this style of camera? And we've started doing, you know, themed episodes. The, the Mamiya one was really amazing. But right before that, we did the Grayflex one, which was like, probably the episode for us that exploded our listenership like skyrocketed with the gray flex episode and it's continued to go up since then so um you know doing the theme shows has been great but bob one themed brand that in 50 episodes we've never really dedicated a whole episode to is actually nikon we've we've talked about it quite a bit yeah. you know bits yes, and pieces have. you probably could make a whole episode out of all the times we've talked about nikon and, uh, you know, hell, even the last episode, I shared the the David Douglas Duncan, June Mickey story. Yeah. Yeah, so it comes up quite a bit, but we're going to have to do something, you know, maybe more Nikon centric, maybe get you and Wes on the show again or something like that. You know, who knows? We'll see what we can do. We have uh, Theo's here. Hey, Theo. Hey, how's everyone? Johnny, good to see you here, mate. Yeah, you too. It's been quite a while. It's been quite a while. <laughs> Hi, Robert. Theo, how are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm good, thanks. How's the headache? Uh, it's it's getting better. <laughs> it's getting better. <laughs> now, finding the older you get, the more the longer wine takes to sort of get out of your system. <laughs> Theo was saying it's a good thing we didn't record yesterday because uh, he would have been a bit inebriated. So uh, we we got sober but uh, hung over Theo today. 
Because <laughs> it's Saturday for you, right? Yeah, Saturday morning. So, um, Johnny, you know, kind of just one thing that I think has never, ever, like, publicly been discussed or announced was like when was the official end of classic lenses podcast i mean well i think if you ask depending on who you ask it's it's never quite and we're like fugazi it's never actually ended. <laughs> it's just on permanent hiatus so i don't know i mean I, it's been what a year i think since we recorded one but we've we've never actually said well this is the final episode it just yeah you know Sort of not doing it. Simon had threatened to release one that he'd gone to Germany to visit Zeiss. Right. And yes. uh and, and I guess he's under non-disclosure because that kind of vanished. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> yeah. Now have you stayed in touch with Perry? Because I, I know that he's had some troubles in Hong Kong. Uh Perry kind of went radio silent, very literally. Uh um, yeah. So I we Every once in a while, somebody tells me they chatted with Perry, but I, I haven't talked with him. I'm, I miss him. I, it's been aging. Um, so I, I, I don't know. But yes, I, my understanding is that, you know, the uh, complexities of living in a Chinese metropolis is is problematic, is, is definitely part of it. You know, Perry was a great guy. He was always super enthusiastic. I, I always wondered if he really could see all the differences in all the lens he shot, like he claimed he could. But uh, <laughs> to, to just see him go suddenly radio silent on it was a little concerning. And I remember I tried to reach out to him a couple of times and was never able to. So, yeah, I, as far as I understand it, he's fine. He just, you know, does not have as much ability for many reasons to do what he was doing. Yeah. Thinking back to some of our episodes, I mean, I, I feel like I have a couple episodes that really stand out to me. Uh, Johnny, you had said that 51 for you guys was kind of a, a, a really eye opener or something along those lines. You know, for me, I, I'll go back even to when uh, we had Steve Sasson on. I think that's probably my favorite episode. And it's funny because, you know, Steve Sasson invented the digital camera. And, you know, this has been a show where it's been probably, what, 95% film you know but you know hearing the story of someone who um who did such a significant achievement when we had robert shanebrook on you know talking to a guy who's built something that's currently sitting on the moon you know is just super super cool and you know all the other episodes like where remember that one episode where that guy from south africa just showed up i can't i forget what his name was yeah he had a real british sounding accent but i'm like that doesn't sound british to me he's like i'm from from johannesburg we're getting reach in places i would have never thought and uh anthony does a lot of the social media and you you start you you see engagement on instagram from people that aren't in the facebook group so there's little pockets right of people absolutely yeah it's it's actually it's, it's kind of interesting that it's a very different group of people that follow and interact on instagram than on the facebook group and we get a lot of traction on on what we post on on Instagram. It's interesting, you know. And I and I personally, you know, I always wanted to maintain the Instagram account to be like a visual diary of everything we talk about, since we right. are only on audio. And everybody's like, "What the hell are these crazy cameras you're talking about?" Yeah. And to be able to actually track down and post everything we talk about, it's a bit of a chore. But even for me, it's like really fun because I've never seen two thirds of the cameras we're talking about. And that's been a request we've heard a lot. You know, what can we see the cameras you guys are talking about? You know, we have our video on now so I can see Johnny and Theo and Paul mm -hmm. and everybody. But uh, this is an audio format. And to do editing, including the video, would just be astronomically prohibitive, uh, something more than I'm willing to take on. So having that Instagram feed of all the different models we talk about, I think is a huge help. It, it's worth mentioning that Instagram feed automatically replicates onto our the Camerosity Facebook page. So you don't even have to join the group if you wanted to have just yeah. see the cameras. You could just go to the Facebook page if you're not on Instagram. That's a good, good point. What about you guys? Like, Paul, at what point did you kind of realize, like, this is, you know, something a little bit cooler than just a bunch of idiots sitting around in front of their computer talking about cameras? You know, I, I had never heard an episode before I was a guest. So I, I really didn't know what to expect, but... I think Bob might have been on one of the first episodes. And of course I knew who Bob was because Bob is legendary, but we found out we have we had we also have mutual friends, which are yeah. is pretty cool too. Yeah. Uh, but you know, when when we were able to attract people like Bob and Dan Tamarkin and and uh Bob Shanebrook and and Sasson and you know, it's just it it, it really pointed out that uh there's a lot of information out there and it's very cool to be able to share that information uh, like we do and have some fun while we're doing it. 
You know, the big thing to me, actually, and, and a lot, listeners probably don't realize this, the four of us talk every day. I mean, we, we email or message each other uh, multiple times a day. And uh, and we have a lot of fun. It's it's as much fun to us as it is uh, doing the actual podcast. Sometimes we get into such a good discussion in the private chat. It's like we should save this for the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that because we always had a chat constantly going for Classic Lenses podcast, and the same exact thing would happen. We'd be like, we should be we should be recording this, you know. But we would have an ongoing chat all the time. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll back with Carl even way back, you know, I mean, it even it, it really started more. It came out of a chat for the Classic Lenses podcast admin group to begin with. So it, I, maybe something that not everybody who doesn't do podcasts doesn't know is that I, I think this is somewhat of a universal thing. Like that I think people who who do podcasts like this do have these conversations like it's kind of hard not to, right? It's just you're constantly having this back and forth. Well, you think of something and you want to share it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, somebody or, or uh, Anthony will get some exceptionally cool pictures out of some weird camera that he's uh, made its way from Australia and wound up on a street corner under a bus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so he feels like he needs to share those pictures with us and we want to see him. So then that just feeds on itself. I got, I got lured into this whole thing with the promise of cocaine and waffles, you know, <laughs> which is a very Florida thing. You know, I thought Florida cocaine waffles. Yeah. That's my wheelhouse. <laughs> um, you know, when I think back to the, the, the 50 episodes we've done, the ones that like, that I kind of have a real soft spot for, or when we get the people like, like Liz Potter talking about using her Noblex uh, 120 to do these medium format panoramas. When we had Nafiz with his giant Polaroid, and, you know, these different people that are, are finding ways to be absolutely creative with these these cameras that are like really on the periphery of what people think of when they think about using vintage cameras. Those stories always fascinate me. And then having people like Dan Tamarkin and, and, and Shane Burke on like, you know, the moon story beside the point, that dude was the head of like the, the portrait project and oversaw the demise of Kodachrome. And I mean, his stories that he had about, you know, winding things down with the film section, like just even why we'll never have um, aerochrome infrared again. Uh, you know, the, those those sorts of stories, I think that it really contributes to the community understanding of film photography in a way that you just, you, you don't find other places. And for me, just to be along for the ride, and it's a real thrill just to, to just let these stories sort of unfold on the show. Well, and it's just very important to me. We're losing people every day. You know, Chris Sherlock retired. We've had people who are no longer repairing and, and some people pass away. You know, Larry Gubas is gone. You know, uh, Peter Decker, it's gone. There's so many people we've lost. And while those people may have written books or maybe they've participated online, there's no way they shared all those stories. So I feel like between my site uh, and this podcast, getting some of those stories out, I'll go back to the Steven Sasson episode. It, it's not hard to find, you know, Steve's very proud of what he did. You could read a lot about him. A lot of the information about how he started, how he was kind of assigned that project to just figure something out. You could read a lot of that online. You know, I mean, the story can only be told so many ways. But when you listen to that episode, he started off with a lot of the same stuff we kind of already knew. But then he started sharing more stories, you know, like he shared a story about going, I think it was like Yosemite or something. And he saw people there, you know, using digital cameras for the first time. And that was kind of like a, wow, like this may actually start to catch on. And we started to hear more of those stories, you know, the deep cuts, so to speak that, uh, you know, maybe we wouldn't have heard otherwise, but having a podcast where we get these people on and just sharing those stories, because one day those people aren't going to be around anymore. And, um, and I'm not, I'm not naive enough to think that, you know, a hundred years from now, people still may listen to the Camerosity podcast, but in some way, you know, we are, we are preserving some of those stories and some of that information for people to find out later. There's only so much that people have written and written down. So, I just love hearing, I love stories. That's like always been my thing. You you know, I like the history. I like hearing the behind the scenes stuff about things. Well, uh, Mike, I got a question. Sure. Everybody knows that Bob is the repository of information on Nikon cameras. But how did that happen? How did it happen? Yeah. How did you get started doing that? Well, <laughs> I bought, I, I built my first darkroom when I was 12 years old. So I've been in photography for a long time. Okay. 
when I went away to school, I wanted to get an Nikon F because that was the camera in the world. I finally was able to. I did some work at school. I bought more cameras. But then I picked up at my local camera store at, when I was at school an SP, which I bought mainly because the F was too loud. I'd be shooting meetings or whatever, graduations at school and whatever. And when the F went off, you heard it. So I found this SP. It was All the controls were almost identical to the F, and it was quiet. So I bought it to shoot with. That was my first range finder. I bought it to actually shoot with. Then when I graduated, I had some time on my hands. I actually had started to have some money so I could start shooting color, which I couldn't do in college. But anyway, then I just started going through some magazines. And I started learning more about the range finders, which, of course, were gone before I got into it. You know, I wasn't born until 48. So by the time I got into photography, it was already 1960, and the F was out, and the SP was already almost gone. So that, that was all ancient history as far as I was concerned. There was nothing in the, in the literature to read. So I went to the Chicago Public Library and spent days there. I looked through every single photography magazine they had. I mean, they used to bring it down to me in carts. You know, I'd sit there for hours. And I just kept reading more and more about these rangefinder cameras. And I just started writing everything down. And then I found a couple. I found Shutterbug. Remember Shutterbug? Oh, sure. I found Shutterbug. Uh, I think 1973, I think I subscribed to Shutterbug. Shutterbug. I didn't graduate to 71. So in 73, I, I got Shutterbug. And I started seeing these little ads from people selling these things. And there was a fella in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a Japanese fellow by the name of Yuki Kawai. And he was a Nikon rangefinder collector. I said, oh, there's somebody else besides me out there? So I call him up. And we get together. I actually go to his house in Ann Arbor. We sat there all day looking at his stuff and whatever. And then I met another fellow by the name of Bill Krause, who was in Pennsylvania. And uh, he was also a Nikon collector. And I met Burton Rubin, the great Burton Rubin, who was a dentist in New York. And all the, we were the original four. OK, we were the original four Nikon collectors. And it just kept going from there. And then in 1981, uh, I said, you know, Leica's got a society. This, this outfit's got, everybody's got a society, but Nikon doesn't have a society. So I, I got a hold of all my people I knew. I said, you know, I'd like to do a book. Would you help me? Because I don't have pictures of every. I don't own everything. So I need pictures. And that came in. I put a, the first book together, which I self-published in Chicago, just a paperback. And uh, then the second book was done by uh, Derek Grossmark in, in England, a Hove Camera. And uh, that was a hard bond. That was in 83. And then also in 83 is when I founded the Nikon Historical Society. I published a quarterly magazine for that. As a matter of fact, the issue that will come, not this issue, but the next issue in September will be our 40th anniversary issue. So we've been around a while. Okay, So I've got 40, 40 years of those things I've been doing. It just kept going. It's a learning process. I've got a database that has something like 28,000 serial numbers in it that I've collected over the years and things like this. So it just kept going and going and going and it kept me, I had, a, I had a very, I had a job that was all consuming. I was a pharmacist for, for 42 years, okay? I used to work six and seven days a week. There was one job I had for 10 years. I was off every other Sunday. I worked 13 days on and one day off. So my job was all consuming. And when I, I needed something when I went home to forget about all that. The collecting did it, did it for me. And I tra- I've been to, been to Tokyo five times. I've been to the factory five times. I've interviewed all the guys that designed them, which of course, they're all, they're all dead now. You know, but I interviewed everybody who designed the rangefinders. They're all gone. Uh, I started a society. We've had conventions all over the world. And um, number 17 is coming up in Germany in September. It's just something that just snowballed. and It just kept going. And, and so that you also started collecting at that time. Oh, yeah. I started collecting. And, well, when I got that first SP, I was probably, a, I think I was a senior. The farming was five years. I was at my fourth year. So that would have been about 1969. When I graduated, that's all I had was the SP plus all my Fs, which I used to shoot. And then I started going to the camera store. Then I went to Central Camera. Johnny, I used to go to Central Camera a long time ago. This is 1971 I was going to Central. Going to Altman's. Remember Altman's? Used to go there all the time. But uh, then I started seeing more. And I started picking up little things here and there. And, of course, Shutterbug. You know, and things were cheap back then. The prices back there were almost comical, you know, compared to what they are now. Bob, was there a time, like, when you finally made it to Japan, you know, you're finally getting sort of recognized by the people at the Nikon factory where you yeah. thought, yeah, this is a real thing. Well, what happened was the first trip I made in 87 and we arrive at the hotel. I went with two other fellows from here in the United States. We went to the hotel. We walk in the hotel and there's six people waiting for us by the check-in counter. So, you know, they were just, they were just there. They were, they were, they were members of, of a different society. Whatever. We just all got together and we were up to like one o'clock in the morning, their time, which is, we were already up like 36 hours. So we were dead to the world. But anyway, they were waiting for us. They took us all over Japan. They took us everywhere. They took us to the factory. Um, they took us uh, to all the stores. You know, in those days, in 87, being a Westerner and going to Tokyo was kind of a hard thing to do. Okay. The Japanese didn't want to deal with you. 
you'd walk into a store in, in Tokyo and all of them would just kind of like shy away from it. You know, they, they, didn't, they were afraid of us, I guess. But then if you'd go with a local, which I did, local guys would take them to the various camera stores in, in, in the Ginza and it's a different story altogether. Yeah, so you're you know you're just they, they just won't let you out of the building after a while. But anyway, so it, yeah, it was they they all they they took us everywhere and they introduced us to everyone. And then we finally I met uh, the fellows who actually designed the cameras. And I I was even went I went to Nikon headquarters in Tokyo. Uh, I was there on the day of their stock stockholders meeting. Believe it or not. Anyway, I was up on the fifth floor. I was interviewing Fukeda, who designed the Nikon one all the way through the Nikon F. And there were a couple other guys there, Fukuoka, who, did the, who designed the motor. And I'm standing there by the window, and I'm looking down, and I'm looking down into the Imperial Palace grounds. They were right next door to the Imperial Palace. I'm looking down over the moat in the, in the Imperial Palace. I was there all day. And then the next day, we met again, I think another six hours with him. And he was like 80-some years old by that time, you know. And he was he was a fabulous fellow for Kata. He really was. I also met the, a guy by the name of Sato, who designed the F2 you know, it was just, it just started from there. It just kept going. And did you, you found probably the same as I did, that the longer you do it, the easier it gets to find stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because you'll have people say, somebody you know will call and say, hey, were you looking for one of these? And yes, I just yes. saw one of these over. So oh, or yeah. I just got this and I really don't need two of them. Well, you know, before the internet, uh, it was all fax machines. Remember fax machines? Okay. Oh. I mean, everybody had a fax machine, right? Nobody had internet. And then you had Shutterbug, of course. And then you started just doing, actually writing letters, which nobody does anymore. And uh, that's how you communicate. I was getting letters from all over the world. And I was answering them as well as I could, getting a lot of faxes and whatever. And it just kept snowballing you know, as you met Eastbury. Then being, I, I live right near Chicago, okay? And I belonged to Chicago Photographic Collector Society from 1973 also. As a matter of fact, I was treasurer for 20 years because nobody else would do it. <laughs> I was the treasurer for so long that the, 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 corp, the uh, club's checkbooks had my address on them. And we had two shows a year, and we used to have all the Japanese buy them. It was so funny. I, they'd come here for those shows, and I'd go to Tokyo. I'd walk into one of the stores, and there would be one of the buyers. And he'd go, he'd recognize me. You know, and he, one time they pulled me in the back room to show me a bunch of stuff. It took us two hours to get out of the place. You know, so it's just, it just, it just keeps going. But at first, they were very, very resistant to America. They were afraid of America. They didn't want to deal with us. And uh, but you, if you had a local with you, then they couldn't they couldn't embarrass him. They had to make sure that they were, you know, I'd walk into a store and there was a place called Nikon, Nikon House, which is right on the corner of the Ginza, which is gone now. And uh, I walk in there and I'm with a local and he introduces me and the guy goes, ah, he goes in the back room, he comes out with a copy of my book and he makes me sign it for him. Oh. So just, kept, just kept breaking the ice all the time, all the time. So it just kept going. They were they were actually surprised that I was so interested in what they did. As a matter of fact, I would be talking with Fukeda for all those hours. I'd say something, I'd quote something. And he goes, I think you know more about that than we do. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, it was because they were just a job to them. They, they weren't, you know, yeah. looking at the same, from the same point of view as we are. To them, it was just work. And uh, so when I started quoting different things, he just kind of shook his head and said, you know, I, and it just kept going from there. And it, it's been a full time thing now for over 40 years. So do you know the guy that does the Thousand and One Nights of Nikon? Mm -hmm. There's a, a website. Yeah, there it's is. A, a thousand One Nights. And this guy is, un, he's a great writer, mm -hmm. but he's got some really cool historical stuff on. Is he Japanese? Yeah, I think he yeah. is. He's internal. He'll yeah, take he's internal. one product and do a, an in-depth look at one, like a lens, a 58 millimeter 1.2. Yeah. You know, or something like that. The, and the design of it and how it came to be and when they did it. You know, the problem I ran into. I used to watch what the, the Leica people were doing. I had all of Jim Lager's books and all this, and I loved Leica's. I used to read all about them. I talked to, to Lager a couple of times, and, you know, he had access to the archives at Leica. He'd go there. They'd turn them loose in the room for hours at a time. He could write everything down. With Nikon, you didn't have that for various reasons. Language barrier, okay, for one. The people there, the, the people who worked for Nikon, you'd never see a prototype get out of the factory like you do with Leica. That doesn't happen in Japan. They don't share things like we do, like Westerners do. They're very tight-lipped about that. So it took years for me to get people to open up to where they would actually start telling me real significant things. And uh, finally, it started to happen. But still, to this day, you know, I've seen prototypes. I've been shown prototypes and things like this, things that never got on the market or whatever. But um, dealing with the Japanese is not the same as dealing with the Germans. So I always envy the Leica collectors because they can have access to so much information serial numbers and all this kind of stuff. We don't have that with Nikon. I had to put all that together myself, like with the black camera bodies, 
you know, the black cameras are rare. They're less than like six or actually less than 5% of the total production was black. Okay. And there was no record of this anywhere. So I just started collecting black serial numbers 40 years ago. I now have a database with something like 8,000 black cameras in it. Okay. By that, we can tell what the fake ones are and the real ones, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to do that all myself. I could never, I never got any of that information from the factory. Not at all. Nothing at all. Do you think that if you had never started the Nikon Historical Society, someone else would have done it? Or was there interest by other people? It might have happened here, although the people that I knew here that were also Nikon collectors never would have done it. It just wasn't their way. Uh, and in Japan, I don't think it would have happened. This until right about now. Uh, you know, you had this fellow, this thousand, this, what you just mentioned, the thousand nights with Nikon. That kind of stuff did not exist 10 years ago. The factory that was not involved, okay? They, they weren't interested. That kind of information just was not made available to the West at all. Yeah. I'm sure there was stuff in Japan going around in the 60s, the 70s, and 80s that I didn't have access to. But there was nothing here in the States. Uh, when I when I started to learn about Nikon at the, at the library in Chicago, I would just read every single I read every single ad, write down this, write down every single test report or whatever. But you'd be surprised how little there was on Nikon until about 1955 when the S2 came out. Before 55, Joe Aaron Wright got involved in December of 54, and before him, the amount of information that was available in print in the Western world was a drop in the bucket. It was nothing. Well, I was going to say it was interesting that of the two manufacturers, Canon and Nikon, the most of the historical information on those two cameras were done by Americans. Yes. Peter Deckard for Canon. And, yep. yeah. and you for, for Nikon. Yeah. And and to a certain extent with Nikon or with Leica, it was Jim Logger and Dennis Laney. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't even the Germans who were involved in it. Right. Right. You know, I, I knew Peter Deckard very well. As a matter of fact, he's been—he was at my house a few times, I, and all this. I, I knew Deckard very well, and he—you know—Deckard was a very educated. He was, had a PhD. I don't know if you know that or not. But Deckard was a PhD, very educated man, and we would talk about things. And he said the same thing. He had so much trouble at the beginning getting any information out of the people in Japan. You just can't get it. They, back in the '60s and the '70s, they just weren't dispensing it. You just couldn't get it. And any books that were written, of course, were in Japanese. They'd never publish them in English. They only publish them in Japanese. Very, very insular that way. They just did not share information. Uh, I think the Germans probably shared a little bit more with Logger than I ever saw with, with Nikon, you know, because I know he, I need, another one was, was Luigi Connie, who also got into the archives with with, uh, with uh, Jim, and they did a lot of research. They came up with the one about the wartime Nike, like us and all that. But I was not able to do that until, until I got there. I saw, when I finally met Fukeda in uh, 91, was when I first started to get an insight into the inside things that were going on, but it's still they they didn't open up that much. What I used, what I had to do originally was I had a bunch of articles in Japanese that I'd gotten from a, a magazine that was published in Japan. It was called Camera Collectors News, and of course it was all in Japanese. So I went downtown to Chicago to the Japanese consulate, and I said, "Do you have any young students that do translating? You know, to make some money on the side?" And the, and the woman behind the counter she gave me a couple cards and I called these people up. I met one of them at a restaurant in, in Chicago Loop one day, a young guy, probably 20 years old, told him what I wanted to do, gave him Xerox copies of the articles that I wanted translated. I said, if you want to do it easily, I said, you just read it into a tape recorder. I can always have it transcribed later. He said, oh, no, I can't do that. I go, why? He says, well, because Japanese is so different than English. He said, I have to read it first in Japanese, decide what it's saying, and then say it in English. So I, it's not like you just can't read it in, from off the page into English. You, it's a three-step process. And he says, there's going to be words in there I'm not going to know because they're technical. You know, Japanese, Japan, Japanese has 14,000 characters. In it. You need 7,000 of them to read the newspaper. But there's a bunch of characters in there that they have. They're not universal. In other words, you know, things that are dealing with photography. He doesn't know anything about photography. These things are going to go right over his head. He's not going to know what they mean. So it was very difficult to get things translated. Very difficult. So I tried that a couple of times, but I wasn't getting too far. You know, a couple of little little short magazine articles. I couldn't get anything expensive uh, translated because nobody could do it. To this day, they still publish almost everything over there in Japanese. They don't do, they do very little in English. I find that barrier or wall or whatever still exists because yes. I think to like the Facebook page, you don't see too many Japanese collectors on Facebook, right? I mean, maybe they don't use Facebook. I don't know. Yeah, they do. There's some on there. There's some on there. There's, there's not a lot though. And like this show is hosted through a service called Podbean and Podbean actually can track where the show is streaming to. And there's, there's almost zero traffic to yeah. Japan. You know, I mean, in fact, 
at, at our normal time, this is Friday night, but at our normal time, it's actually like in the morning for Japan, you know? Yeah. So like you would think that it would be, we would at least attract a few people. But I, you know, when I think of books, I have Sugiyama's book. Yeah. I, I don't know of many Japanese books that are like must haves, you know, like the Larry Gubas, you know, your, your Nikon rangefinder book, Peter Deckard's books, like Paul said, they're almost all either Americans. Yeah. Uh, Peter Kitchingman's from Australia yeah. uh, or, you know, like you said, lager from, for Germany, you know, but you just, I, I don't even know of any resource that I would go to. Yeah. So the cultural differences. Yes. Very big, very make, big. Make it more difficult to, to yes, get it's it. Very, it's very difficult. They, you know, once they trust you and like you, then then they open up a little bit. The, I think that's one of the reasons why Joe Ehrenreich was able to deal with Nikon, yeah, so, so easily. Joe really was a Joe was a worldly man. I mean, he really understood. You know, you know what they called him? What they called him Typhoon Son. Actually, they called him Typhoon Son. What they called him? He he was a tough guy. He really was. He was, and he got them moving on all kinds of stuff. A lot of what happened in Nikon happened because of Joe Ehrenreich. That's what that was Canon's problem. They never had a Joe Ehrenreich. So they couldn't they couldn't compete with with Nikon in the United States. They did in Europe, but they couldn't do it in the United States. When Joe passed away, the uh, his sons were involved in the business, but they yes. weren't they weren't Joe Ehrenreich. No, Jonathan was one of them. I can't remember what the other son was. Gil. Yeah, yeah. They didn't they didn't have it. They didn't have it. No. They didn't. They didn't. And uh, then when Nikon USA came in, uh, this was this was my this is my anniversary story. So I, I got to okay. tell this. You'll remember this. Nikon came out with a 25th anniversary F2A camera, mm -hmm. and they had convinced the Japanese they wanted to do one. Well, the Japanese didn't really want much to do with it. So what What John Klaus, I think, was president at that time, made, had to make 4,000 cameras. And Joe or uh, Nikon USA had uh, some silver boxes printed and had a, a plaque, a wooden plaque, wooden um, plaque. and also a, a little metal piece that that on the uh, front on the front well they glued they, on they had they were glued on they had a kid from the mail room and a tube of elmer's glue yeah <laughs> on the bottom they had a serial number they had yeah, a serial number so, on the well, bottom here's the thing they had four thousand cameras made but they only made the serial numbers to 2500 yeah was that was a lot more it was a lot better to only have 2500 than yeah. four thousand. you got the nice wooden plaque that had your name on plaque that your your serial name. number and and the, the the bad thing was that the glue kept coming loose on the little 25th anniversary thing, and the metal yep. things would fall off. Fall off. Fortunately, yep. the glue was so cheap, it didn't mar the metal on the body, no. so it still looked fine. That was, I think that was the, the worst anniversary special limited. It didn't edition. work too well. <laughs> it did not work. Uh-uh, did not work too well. And the thing is, they could have been, they could have done an engraving on the front of that camera, very easily because the Japanese do this all the time, okay? But that plate, I guess they thought it looked better, but it didn't work out too well. Did Nikon Corporate ever like honor the the historical society with like a special edition like Leica did? No, so I know that there were several no. like Leica. Mm -mm, nothing. Nikon has never done anything for me like that. No, uh, it's a shame. Well, like I say, it's different. You know, the the Leica collectors just had a, a different different world to deal with than I did, and Nikon just never mentioned it. Never, never came up with anything like that, you know. So what are you going to do? I don't want to get too far off topic, but you were talking about serial numbers. And um, a couple of days ago in one of the Facebook groups, uh, someone posted a Nikon. I think it was an S with the 906 serial numbers. Yes, yeah, 906, right. That, that was Kevin Lee. So, Bob, explain how the original Nikon, the mother Nikon, the serial number incorporated the year into okay. it, right? The, the, the final design... Not the day of production, but the final design of the Nikon one was September of 1946. The first three serial, first three numbers in the serial number was 609 for six for 1946 and 09 for September. Okay, so the very first camera which I've held in my hands is 6091. They still have that's mother have 6091, Nikon. 6094, and 6097 are still within company hands, and so it went up from there. So the second camera would have been 6092, et cetera, et cetera. So the 609 designated the date. It also turns out to be a coincidence. When the Nikon 1 was designed, it was also the 206th year of the Japanese calendar. So it's it's there's, there's an argument as to what did it really represent. Was it the 206th year of the Japanese camera a calendar, or was it because it was September of 46? But anyway, that's where the 609 came from. So all through 
they kept doing that. They kept adding on that to that 609 until they got up to 609 9999. But well, then you would think they'd go to 610. Well, they didn't. They kept going. They went to 609 and they went to 10,000, whatever. They made about 1,200 cameras too far. They call those the eight digit. Eight cameras. digit, right. They have an oh, extra okay. digit in them because they, they're 609, 10,000 and up. Okay. They went to like 1,215, 10,215 or whatever it was. Then they reverted back to 610 after that. So the 609 disappeared. But the thing is, the 609, if you look at it, the six and the nine are the exact same numeral, just one's upside down compared to the other one, all right? So what happened was, for some reason, nobody knows why, twice, at least twice, they punched out a bunch of top plates. Instead of 609, they did 906. They turned it around. They, I don't know if they put it into the into the press backwards or what, but something happened. They come out with 906. Nikon was so well-renowned for quality control. You've shared stories about how lenses would come off the assembly line. And if there was even one occlusion, they would smash it and throw it away. So Ever, yeah. how, how could something so obvious make it past if it was a mistake? Well, the thing is, it didn't. It didn't make it past. And here's why. The 906s were made in relatively small numbers, maybe as many as a couple hundred, Okay. And of course, they're valued today because they're they're errors. I've actually, when I was in Tokyo, the first or second time, I actually had a fella bring in his 906 camera to show me, and he had the paperwork with it, the warranty card and everything. And there on that warranty card, it didn't say 609, it said 906. So they even knew when they were making the warranty cards. They knew it, but it wasn't worth it to them to, to, to change it. You know, the part was too expensive to waste, so they didn't change it. You know, they, they knew about it. They knew about it. There's some other errors, too, that they made. There, there's a series of lenses. Uh, a lot of things we find with an asterisk after it. Those are duplicate serial numbers, okay? They don't show up too much in the cameras, but they do show up in lenses a lot. And uh, I have a couple that are actually, I have both versions. I have the non-asterisk and the asterisk, and they have the same serial number. They're just two different lenses. But the thing is, they did make errors, but they were actually aware of it most of the time. But they didn't want to go through the trouble of, of scrapping it and starting over. They just They just used it. Well, I, I think they probably didn't think it was important. No, I mean, they didn't. They're, they're it was just a number. Was, it was just a number. Yeah. I mean, they, Fouquet they said looking, the same thing. Just the only reason we put a number on it was for warranty control. Yeah, it wasn't looking at it as a historical document. You know, they were they were building cameras that people would, would use professionally or, or use, for, you know, for it was a an item that that was for the for people and it was a movable object it wasn't you know it was something there and the thing is he said the only reason we put serial numbers on things was to keep track of it for warranty purposes that was the only reason the numbers didn't really mean that much to them as a matter of fact if you look at their production like in my database you, if you follow the production of serial numbers you'll see things that aren't quite right you'll see an occupied japan serial number later than a non-occupied Japan serial number. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be the other way around. So they were just, they were doing this all the time. And we were used to that. You know, it was a lot of times when in the old days with Shutterbug, when you would buy, there was no pictures or anything. You'd buy something through the mail. Uh, you didn't know, you didn't know exactly what you were going to get into the box arrived. You know, so it was it So was I have fun a question. If you're buying things through Shutterbug Magazine, like how do you pay for it? You couldn't pay for In those people. days? Oh, no, no. In those days, I used to use money orders. Money orders. Money orders. Yeah. They go to the post office and a money order. So you would send them the money and then they'd send you the camera? Yeah. Unless you're unless you're buying from Jim Keel. Yeah. Jim Keel was a dealer in uh, Topeka, Kansas. Yeah. And you would call Jim Keel and he, and he would answer the phone no matter what what yeah. time of the day it was, night, holidays, whatever. And uh, you would tell him what you wanted. And he says, I think I have one of those and I think yeah. we could do this. And he says, I'll give me your name and address. I'll get it out to you. And you just send yeah. it to so uh, I want to ask Johnny a question. You know, John, you knew Robert before I did. And we mentioned earlier about episode 51 of the Classic Lenses podcast. But how far back had you known Robert, you know, from him going to Central Camera? Oh, I don't see. Like, when did you guys first meet? I don't remember. I've, I don't, been going yeah. to, I've been going to Central Camera long before you probably knew what cameras were. Okay. I've, I've been going to Central <laughs> Camera since I was in right. high school. Okay. Wow. I'm talking 60, you know, 66, 67. 60. I was. I used to go to Central. I had a route I would take. I'd go to yeah. I'd Altman's and I hit Central. You know, I right. had all of them. And uh, uh, I remember when 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 uh, Altman's was on on South State Street also or South okay. Wabash also underneath the L long ago. But so I was going to Central when John when 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 Flesh's Don Flesh's father was probably still alive and running the store. And then I met Don. Oh, I met Don Flesh what thirty some years ago, thirty five years ago at least. You know. So, wow. so I don't know how long you've worked there, but uh, how far back you go. But I go back further. Oh, for sure. I, I mean, I used to go there 
when I was in college in the late eighties, early nineties, yeah. I would go there. Yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, I would buy supplies there for. Yeah. Oh yeah. They were, class. Oh, they, they supplied almost like Columbia college. Almost oh, yeah, all they, the dudes, were, they all came to him. Yeah. Right. Cause it was right there. It was closest to the closest place. Oh, yeah. So I used to go there in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties. I started, I mean, I had even probably been there in high school once, but I started going there regularly when I was a student, you know, down in the city. Um, and I would get supplies and decide if I had enough money to buy chemistry or cigarettes that yeah, day, know. you know, and, and it's funny because um, a guy that I work with there now, Charles Azaki, his dad worked there. Little oh, Japanese guy. You remember I John? It. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. There so was a John, guy that worked there. John he was behind the counter. I used to see him all the time. There was this one guy that worked behind the counter. I didn't really know his name, but I we knew each other by face, you know, because I was yeah. in there so often. So we got to talking one day and he says, you know, where are you from? And I go, I'm I'm, I'm from Chicago Heights, Illinois, which is south, right? He goes, Oh, I'm from Flossmore, five minutes away from me. <laughs> and he's working the counter at, at uh Wow. At, Central. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. So, but yeah. I, I didn't work there until I think I started in 2015, 16. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I've been going there regularly for years oh, yeah. to, to do uh, film developing. I mean, I've been yeah. going there as a regular after college. I started going again. I was probably early 2000s. I started going yeah. all the time because I was, I was getting my film done there. So it's, you know, so, but I didn't start working there until so 2015, 16, you know, that, that, that store never changed. That store, I don't think he, I don't think he ever pulled out a paintbrush. The whole no. time he was there. No. But you know what? I knew people that worked up there, camera collectors that were in the Chicago society with me. And I had one of them tell me when they says, I go by there every single day on my lunch hour to see what's in the window. You have to check <laughs> yeah. out the window because that window would change constantly. And yeah. the woke camera, remember woke camera, which was yeah. next door to Almonds. Walt yes. tried to do this. Walt also had a fantastic front window. He used to watch Altman's front window was a waste of time. Okay, right. for some reason. But Walt camera had a fantastic front window, and Central had a fantastic front window. If you didn't check it out every day, you'd miss some really great things. And apparently, Don Don told me this one day. We were talking about the old stores. Apparently, a guy from Central went to work at Walt, which yes. is why it looked that way because it was actually a <laughs> could guy be that used to work at could Central because that drew more people, and you'd stand in front of it and. It was no, there was very, very little new stuff in the window. It was all, yeah. all new stuff. So it would change daily, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the, the things that they would come up with back in those days. You know, those big stores in Chicago, they they would buy up all kinds of stuff. Helix was another one. Helix up on North Orleans. Remember them? They oh, would yeah. buy out. Yep. I remember when, when Aaron Reich computerized their warehouse in on Long Island years back, okay? When they went to computerize their warehouse, they started finding all kinds of things that they didn't know they had. Wow. And they went to Helix. They made them an offer they couldn't refuse. And they, they got a truckload of stuff, yeah. stuff that was recently discontinued or, or yeah. relatively uncommon or whatever. And these big stores would buy this stuff up by the by the crates, you know. Yep. So it's but those days are all gone. All those stores are gone. Oh, yeah. They're all gone. Central's the only one left. It's the only the one last left. man standing. Yeah. Yeah. It's the only one left. It's funny because I routinely see equipment comes in for pot for sale that I, I do the evaluations of all the equipment. So I see yeah. this stuff come in and I see stickers all the time. I mean, yeah. I saw, I saw one today. I saw a Wolk camera sticker. So I, you know, so I see the little price stickers still on the boxes and stuff. It's amazing. It's like a you had Wolk camera, you had Dearborn, you had full camera, photo world, you had all yeah. kinds of stuff. Yeah. They're yeah. all, all of them are gone. They're all gone. Yeah. Chicago is a vast wasteland now. <laughs> even, even the pawn shops are gone. I used to hit all the pawn shops on South Buren, Van Buren and buy all kinds of stuff. Yeah. They're all gone. Yeah, Only thing yeah. left is central. So, so, hey, Johnny, are you still shooting anything? Last time I remember, <laughs> you were shooting the uh, the the roll eye uh, rangefinder. Yeah, although it's it's weird. It, I have not been shooting as much stuff because I still I, the, our basement in the house we bought is still not finished, so I'm not shooting really any film because I can't develop it. I've got <laughs> I've got four years worth of film backed up to develop that's in the freezer. <laughs> Oh, so I, I'm not shooting anymore because I, I don't want to just add to the, I've got at least a hundred rolls of film that need to be processed. Oh, really? that's, oh. that's painful. That's yeah. anxiety inducing. When it's I get a backlog. Just, you throw it yeah, in the freezer. Hours. It's like, it's like AI or something. It's just sitting there in limbo forever until you wake it up. Um, but so that it's funny you say, so the thing that I'm shooting and I just, I went to see my dad in Wisconsin this past weekend. And this is what I was shooting. 
but well, of it's course a, a Polaroid. It's a it's a Kodak uh, 110A converted to have a Polaroid pack film back. And I'm the crazy man that still has, I think, 20 packs of Polaroid film in my mini fridge. So I'm, you know, it's they expired in 2013. So it's 10 years old. I'm like, I better start shooting this stuff. So I, I was shooting this, which I had gotten at Central. It's on, let's call it a indefinite loan from Central. And I, had, I hadn't shot it. I had it a year and I hadn't shot it. So I took some film up there and shot it and it's it's beautiful i mean it's a focusable you know it's a focusable range finder that's been converted to pack film so it's i've had i've tried all different ways to shoot pack film and this is by far the best way i've ever done it and hey no developing no no well that that's there you go i mean that's why i love instant film is i don't have to worry about processing it i just peel it and i'm done you know that's big that's pretty much what i'm shooting film wise these days when i shoot is uh, is this I do still from time to time carry on and shoot my uh, Leica 3A. That's about the only film camera I carry around and shoot, you know, other than an instant these days. I mean, I, I I just don't really shoot anything else. It's just it's perfect, pure minimalism for me. Um, so that's that's about it. With the Polaroid, though, you know, there's a whole a whole series of young photographers who will never know the joy of waving a Polaroid print. <laughs> I, well, while it's or the dry, get yeah, the dry exactly. faster. The dry, exactly. and I mean, and I grew up with it because my both my parents worked at Polaroid. That's where they met. So really? I, you know, I yeah. So I I grew up around. Pol- I mean, it was just around the house. My dad was a Polaroid salesman, so I, he always had film and camera, you know, Polaroid stuff. So to me, it's just second nature. I mean, the smell of the coder for the. Yeah, black and white well, prints. I, I, you know. I remember that so distinctly. We get those little coders. They come in sometimes in equipment at uh, Central for evaluation. And so me and Charles open them up. And we're like, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like it's like the old bubble gum from baseball cards. It's like a very specific, peculiar smell that it's like instant. You know, this instant hits you in the brain, way deep in your brain of this nostalgia that you grew up with, you know? Or, so, and also yeah. the clearing tanks for the, for the, uh, yeah, the clearing the tanks. Yeah. Clearing tanks with the, I was talking about clearing tanks with my dad. Um, I, I had a, so I, I was shooting FP 3000 B in this thing, uh, with a, I've got a red filter on there. So I was shooting that, but I also, every once in a while at central, we get a half used old pack of Polaroid film and you never know if they're going to work. So I had an old pack, of uh 107 um i it was probably from the early 70s and i'm yeah, yeah. shocked that i got images out of it i mean they're ghostly but i got images out of it but they actually need to be coded i still need to code them because it's pre-coded which i think was 1979 they came out with coderless 107c 107c exactly no coding you know yeah so every once in a while we get an ancient pack of film and i'll try shooting it so Used to be a time when you'd be walking through like parks or whatever, or museums, or you'd find you'd see on the ground the stuff that was thrown away from the Polaroid shooters, you know. Yes, and and actually, it's funny you say that because so my dad worked for Polaroid starting in I think 1965, 66, um, and he was he was working in the box factory. He I think he I think he'd been kicked out of college. He was he started working at Polaroid in the box factory in Cambridge. Cambridge. Um, and he saw a, a notice on the Bolton board one day for a salesman job. And he thought, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll, you know, I'll check that out. So he gets high, gets a salesman job at Polaroid. They relocate him to Chicago uh, and he meets my mom. The rest is history. The rest is history. Yeah. But, but I, you know, I talk about that stuff with him and he, one of the stories he tells me, he knew, he knew Dr. Land. I was going to ask you if you ever met him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He met him. And Dr. Land for people, you know, people in this group probably know it. But for the rest of the world was like the he was like the Steve Jobs of the day. Yes, he was. And and so he he had a very low opinion of salesmen because he didn't feel like his products required. It's you know, sell it's gonna, itself, right? It's going to sell itself. Exactly. Yeah. going to sell itself. But anyway, my, my dad was at Polaroid uh, right at the era when they were developing the SX-70. He was there for the rollout of the SX-70. Wow. But one of the uh, motivating factors for developing the SX-70 was Dr. Land didn't like the idea that there was waste from, you know. because then I mean, there was a lot of it because it sold so many cameras, you know. Yeah, right. Waste. 
Yeah, but it's a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of waste with a peel apart. You got eight, eight or ten packs of film. In Didn't the same thing happen with the guy who invented the Keurig? Like regretted doing oh, it yeah. because of how much waste it created. Yes, yes. similar yeah. thing. The landfills are now full of those little cups. Yeah, yeah. So, so the SX70. That's why they put a battery in every camera film pack. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting how you compared uh, Edwin Land to uh, Steve Jobs. When Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, you know, he walks up on stage, real minimalist, pulls the phone out of his pocket. And it was like, this is your phone. You know, this can do all this stuff. Well, I read a story about Edwin Land when he, they released the first SX-70. I believe he walked out on an empty stage, pulled the camera out, unfolded it, and fired off 10 shots. Kind of yeah. with a similar, like, holy shit, what did he just do? You know, yeah. how how is this possible? Right. So I, I think that's a very fair comparison. Were they just pictures of the crowd or? <laughs> Probably. It was the idea that it could be done that quickly, though. Right. I mean, he made that it, it, people I, I don't think people who didn't who aren't just barely old enough to remember it don't understand. He was on the cover of Life magazine. Oh, yeah. For inventing yeah. the SX-70. I mean, it, it was a really I mean, this. The Apple comparison, I think, is very apt because the yeah, it is. Polaroid stuff at that time was very much on a consumer product. That's the other thing. It was the freaking 60s. People did not have the kind of disposable income to spend on stuff that they do now. People spent a huge portion of their, you know, their money on photo related stuff back in photo and movie related stuff back in the day. So it was a really big deal to own a Polaroid camera or to own a movie camera or whatever. Half of my childhood photos are on that, on yeah, Polaroid that right? my parents had. They're yeah. up, I've got some on my wall. What's interesting is we're halfway through the 50th episode. It was about 50 and a half years ago that the SX-70 was actually released. <laughs> yeah. So, so Johnny, an, another bit of sort of Apple comparison is the fact that 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 Land had the had Ames, the Ames's do that rollout film for the SX-70 which is about as high modernist, high art. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the attachment of, of the SX-70, not as a consumer device, but as this piece of, of high modernist art yeah. that, that you could bring into your home, like you could bring an Ames chair into your li- into your den. Uh, you know, it was, it was as much of a lifestyle choice as yeah. a consumer choice. Very, tr- very good comparison. I think that's, there's a lot, there's a lot to that. Those products were highly designed in terms of industrial design as well now how does how does that pedigree kind of compare now to the criticisms that people have of well you know polaroid is kind of sort of a lifestyle brand let's put out a bluetooth speaker (laughs) yeah well it's just a name now you know i mean it doesn't so it's it's different it i mean literally the pat the trademarks and all that were just it's just property right so it's it's definitely different. Luckily, Doctor Land never saw that. Yeah, yeah. P- people would go to parties with their Polaroid cameras and take pictures. I mean, you go to a party with you know all of your oh, friends, yeah. and, and at least at least one person, and probably more than that, would have you know an SX seventy and some flash bars. Yeah, or a swinger. Yeah, or a swinger. Yeah, yeah. a swinger. Oh boy. Yeah. Depends on what depends on what kind of party you go to. Yeah. yeah, that's true. You had said you've gotten some images out of some really old Polaroid film. So yeah. um, a question I have for you, I was always under the assumption that the reason Polaroid film, at least like the 600 film and the SX-70 films don't last quite as long, is it's not necessarily the film inside that doesn't last. It's the development it's chemicals. The developer. So how is it that some Polaroid films, like you said, the FP3000 is still good and you've shot film and got images. Like, why is it that some Polaroid films last longer than others? It's a kind of a crapshoot. I mean, it. Yeah. I think it depends a lot on how the, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, type 100 film. They're usually half exposed. So the pack is literally, you know, you see a sheet on the top that's going to be exposed, but the rest of the pack is actually light safe underneath it. But I'm talking about packs that have been open for 20, 30, 40 years. To oxygen, yeah. Yeah, so you'd think that it would all have oxidized, and it usually has, but every once in a while you get a pack that, for some reason, it spreads just fine. I mean, it it's just, it is what it is. It's weird. It's funny okay. because I, I shot um, some of this old uh, 107, and I showed it to my dad, and he looked at it, and the developer, I've got it in the other room, I could bring the shot out, but the little developer at the end, 
was all like black and chunky. And he's like, that, that doesn't look right. I'm like, yeah, I know it's, it's really old. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's, it's definitely a, definitely a thing. Yeah. So there's, it's just like you said, it's a crap shoot. There's no it's a total, tips or tricks. Could it be crap. also that in the, in like when the camera came out in 47 and throughout the fifties and whatever, we weren't as concerned about things like pollution, et cetera, you know, yeah. uh, and chemicals in the ground water and all this kind of thing. Right. And, I'm sure that the chemicals that they were used in the first Polaroid generations were probably pretty, pretty rough items compared to what's out there today. You know. Yes, I mean they had to, maybe they, maybe the government kind of made them go different uh, and designed their chemicals differently to be less polluting and whatever. So right, I mean that that's part of the you know always the joke when they people were talking about how they were going to make pack film again, and it's like no, you're not. You can't. You can't, you can't even buy those chemicals. EPA won't let you. EPA no. won't let you. <laughs> no, you you can't make it again because it can literally the chemistry. I mean, that's right. They call it Polaroid snot or Polaroid goo. You can't make that stuff anymore. <laughs> no, no, you know? EPA won't let you do it. No, nope. no. We have a Nikon guy and we have a Polaroid uh, guy on the show. Wasn't there a product that crossbreeded Polaroid to Nikon? Wasn't there sure. a back for the th- SLRs? Yeah. Oh yeah, Asinuma made it. They call, it was called the. Um, Pro back. They made one for the F. They made one for the F2. Yeah. They made one for the F3. Yeah. They supposedly made one for the F4, but I've never seen it. And uh, it was, but it wasn't made by Nikon. It was made by Asanuma. Right. And but it had it had all Nikon parts in it. As a matter of fact, the relay lens that was used to do this was a was a, a Al Nikkor 52.8 Al Nikkor was inside that thing, and that would relay the image that you would get it. Yeah, that was uh, something that Nikon was the only one that ever did that, and they made it for a long time. Yeah. I, I saw one the other day. We've got one at Central right now. And if you look at it, you'll have to, guys, will, I'm sure you'll find a picture of it. But it's literally a Nikon F. Yeah. And below it is that essentially the body of a Type 100 pack film camera. Yeah. Like just, you know, mirrors. Also, the first ones were roll film. They yeah, right. Roll film. Roll film. Go back yeah. to roll film. And they had, you know, the, 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 it came with a Nikon F base plate on it. You drop yeah. your camera on there and lock it on. Right. The image went down. And it right. bounced off a 45 degree mirror and it went through this Al Nikkor lens that yep. it hit the film. So it was yep. enlarged to a certain point. Okay. And uh, they made it all the way back to the pack film. Okay. And you yep. know where it got its first real uh, professional use? Cape Canaveral. They use it at Cape Canaveral a lot. They, yep. they take them to, 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 and also professional photographers like in New York and whatever. You could proof a shot real quick to see what their lights were right or had any flare or whatever. Right. You know, they, they, would, they would shoot it with that, that, pa- and then. Translated to the to the yeah, yeah, and shoot exactly. film, but they use that a lot for that. Wouldn't you lose a stop or two doing the lost thir- about thirteen oh, yeah. stops? Yeah, <laughs> it was a speed magni and speed mag. Were, that's what it was. Yeah, if you mag. weren't shooting three thousand film, you weren't going to get anything. Right. right. I mean, yeah. it was you. You you'd lost a lot of light going through the yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. But then Bob an NPC. Yes. Newton oh, Plastics made yeah. uh, made backs for the F three and also for the FE and FM. Yeah. The problem was yeah. that that it only the image size was twenty four by thirty six millimeters. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, back in the day, if you you know that all you needed was to see your exposure was you right to check a fine, light, right? Yeah. You wanted to check a light. That's why. Yeah. yeah, you were checking the lights. Yeah, the speed yeah. magnets also were used for horse races for uh, finish line picture. So one of the stories my dad told me when I saw him this past weekend was. He was at, so the Indy 500 was on, right? It was more Memorial Day, and my dad used to go to the Indy 500 every year for Polaroid with a press pass. And what he did for the first, uh, I don't know, the first few years he did it is he was actually at the finish line taking a photo, photo finish picture, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And and they had he would run it down, and they had a lab there on site to get photos to out to the newspaper before the race was even over. So he took a, this photo that was published in the newspaper in the Indiana star register, or whatever, before the race was over so that people <laughs> would get the photo from the Indy 500 in their evening paper, you know, unbelievable stuff. I mean, that's, that's basically what my dad did is he was like an industrial uh, salesman. He sold, he was at Fermi lab all the time. They would do these atomic, the the test to get the cyclotrons or whatever yeah yeah the accelerator and these they would have a hundred cameras lined up and they would fire this thing off and they he said that they would go start pulling packs start pulling she and there'd be just littered on the floor uh polaroid photos that that would need to be developed i mean it's just crazy stuff because there was no other way to do it polaroid was cutting edge back then period yeah. cutting edge 
the best one, I it should really get my dad on here sometime, but one of his customers was the Chicago Police Department. Okay. And it was a it was a really big deal for them to start uh doing Polaroid because then they could instantly do fingerprints much easier. Um so anyway, he's got this really long story about hands being chopped off in the morgue. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and fingerprints being done on Polaroids and stuff. I mean, for the co- it's amazing the the, uh, the 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 groundbreakingness of instant photography in that era was just it changed everything. You know, yeah. it really did behind the scenes that we don't think about now, but it changed everything. It was some of the benefits we have today with digital, but still in the film era. Very you know, much. I mean, even even going back to 1948 when the original land camera came out, to be able to get an image that quickly even from educational, you know, purposes, right. teaching people about exposure. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it's so hard for people today, younger people to, or even my age, whatever, to understand how big of a deal Polaroid film was. Yeah. You know, there was, I mean, Fuji had its own, you know, competition. We all know Kodak tried making an instant film camera and violated a bunch of copyrights in, in the process. <laughs> but I mean, Polaroid was it. Like, it was like Kleenex. You could buy any tissue. Household, yeah, it was like generic. Still call it a Kleenex. You could have a photocopier made by Canon or Ricoh, but it you still a Xerox machine. Polaroid became synonymous with instant photos. Right. And it was such a huge deal. Yeah. I mean, he, even my another one, my dad, he's still looking for his documents from it, but he used to go out to uh, Carlsbad, California with um, Ansel Adams. So he would oh. go to the Ansel Adams workshops. He's he'd been with Ansel Adams back in the day and do, you know, because Ansel Adams was a huge proponent of Polaroid photography because he could prove things there right. on the spot. And check. yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, a lot of his a lot of his photos, he used the negative out of the type 55 film. So it was a really big deal for him, too. He was a he said that whatever they were paying him was not enough because he had such a huge impact on the professional photography community as far as using Polaroid as proofing material. Well, he, he published several books of, of the Polaroid pictures. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was the print, the negative, you know, the camera, but then yeah. there was another one that was just Polaroid. Yeah. Yeah. So Johnny, yeah, I don't know if you, how many of the back episodes of the show we've listened to Theo briefly mentioned earlier, we had done a show uh, it was like episode 20 or something. And it was like the last three minutes of the show. And this one guy, Nafis, was on the show and he didn't talk a whole lot. And we noticed this huge camera behind him. And, and Thea was uh-huh. like, hey, mate, what's that thing behind you? He goes, oh, it's a Polaroid. And we're like, what? He goes, it's a, the 20 by 24. 20 by 24. And we ended up talking to him a little bit. And he came back on episode 23 and we were able to talk to him a lot more. But he actually works with one of the six 20 by 24 Polaroids that still exist. Wow, and he cool. talked about Elsa Dorfman and stuff like that. Had your dad ever had an experience with those huge Polaroids? Uh, yeah, he, he did do stuff with them. I have to ask him stories about them specifically. Uh, but they were they were a really niche product. Yeah. Oh, sure. Know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he, he definitely, he definitely knew about them. Uh, I don't know much about if he worked with that material at all. It was just so special. Well, who made the film? The Polaroid make the film? Polaroid made the yeah. film. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a two foot tall, yeah. you know, 24 by 20 inch yeah. polar instant image. Right. You know, I mean, just spreading the developer evenly across something that large must've been a pain in the ass too. Well, it, it was, it had a special machine. I mean, yeah. I literally had a, processor for the you know the polaroid film so oh man cost factor must have been tremendous unbelievable yeah people didn't realize that there were the industrial applications for polaroid even at the toward the end of their life yeah like type 809 8 by 10 polaroid film yeah uh, and you know there was just a, a tremendous amount of that being used for for commercial photography and for when spectra came out there was they they had a camera called a Macro Five, which was a, a handheld close-up camera. MR Five, yeah, those are really cool. It was yeah. like shooting with it was hold like holding a bread box with two handles. It had the lights that uh, you move yeah. the camera forward and back, and when you see just two lights, keep moving, and you see one light, you're focused. Yep. Well, they made a special film for it called a, a grid film. The Becton Dickinson, who was a, a big medical research company, yeah, uh, commercial uh, had it made to do photographs of skin lesions on people or or, or wounds because mm-hmm. the film had a grid that was a specific distance. 
so they could take a picture every two or three days and see how the wound was progressing. Yeah. I mean, they just did so many cutting edge things that that uh, people don't realize what they were doing. I'm sure that the I'm sure that the uh, oil industry probably used it for taking pictures inside of pipes and things like this and whatever. You know, that they could if they were worried about something wrong, they could get the image right away and decide whether there is some a problem down there or not, you know. Yeah. I mean another another dad story is during Vietnam they were using uh Polaroid film to do X rays on cluster munitions so that they wouldn't explode in trains transporting cluster munitions. I mean, literally so that bombs wouldn't blow up. They were using Polaroid film to check the munit. It's I mean it just wow. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It's like you, there's no end to the amount of stuff that 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 was being used for. Please talk to your dad. Um, these are the kinds of stories I love to hear. Um, yeah. If he doesn't tell them, your dad's not going to live forever. Those stories will go with him. So I'll, uh, let's, I'll, let's I'll talk to him about them. it. I'm sure he. I'm sure he enjoy doing it. Yeah. While we were talking, actually, it's been about an hour now. But we had Rob Jamison and Andre Dominguez join us. Um, they've spoken here and there. But wanted to give you guys or say hello to you guys. But wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions you got. Uh, any of us here, um, anything you wanted to ask? Follow-up question for uh, for Bob uh, from the uh, Classic Lenses episode that he was on. And I just wanted to ask, you talked about about the predecessor to Nikon, do, about them during the war, and then them con- converting after over all the military stuff that they did during the war. And you, t- you, you mentioned in passing that they did rangefinders for battleships. Yes. I just wanted to ask you how big those rangefinders are, because you talk a lot about base lengths on cameras. What's the base length of a rangefinder on a battleship? The two biggest battleships ever built were the Yamato and its sister ship, the Mishima, or something like this, okay? The guy who designed the rangefinders for those two was Mr. Fukeda, the same one who designed the Nikon 1 all the way through the Nikon F. They were something like six feet across, they were mounted way up on a mast, of course, and they and the prisoners were 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 ground to seconds, not to minutes. They were ground to seconds, and those guns on that Yamato, which were tw- which were sixteen inch guns, were accurate to a hundred feet at twelve miles. That's how accurate those rangefinders were. Nikon also made the periscopes for all the submarines, which have something like twenty pieces of glass in them. So they had to come up with coating technology to get that light to, through there, because otherwise it'd be very dim. Uh, all the bomb sites used at uh, Pearl Harbor were made by Nikon. Nikon made all the battleship binoculars and all the binoculars all the troops carried. Every officer had to have a pair of binoculars. Nikon made all of that. But uh, their binoculars, by the way, uh, we, we captured so many of them at the end of the war, brought them back to the States, and uh, we couldn't believe them. They were so much superior to ours. Okay, they were very much superior to ours. Now, were, were those, you, you mentioned superiority of those optics to the Allied optics. Were they superior to the German optics as well? Do you know that? Do you know that or not? In some respects, yeah. Lights, of course, made a lot of the binoculars in that during the war for for the, for the Germans, and I'm sure Zeiss did too. The Nikon. See, the thing with Nikon was the Japanese didn't have radar, so they depended on their guys up in the crow's nest. Okay, actual visual coverage. They didn't have radar. They had specially trained sailors that they would be picked up because of their eyesight. Okay, and these guys would be up there with these. Battleship binoculars had a 120 inch, 120 millimeter uh, noses on. Okay, no. They'd be up there and they could spot things that even before radar could spot it. Okay. That's the only thing that they had. They didn't have radar. They could spot planes from miles away. But also, what they could do is they had little lights inside of their binoculars for nighttime use. And during the early part of World War II in the South Pacific, the Japanese were just kicking the hell out of us at nighttime. We couldn't fight them, even though we had radar. We couldn't beat them at night because they could see us and we couldn't see them with those binoculars. Later on, when our radar got better, it shifted the other direction. But during the first half of the war, they were killing us at night. We couldn't figure out how they were doing it. How could they even see us? But they could. With those. And they had specially trained guys. That's all they did. That was their only job in the Navy was look up on those up on those crow's nests looking for things. So I'll include it in the uh, Instagram notes. Um, but in the chat for Zoom, I posted two pictures the first one is the tower of the Yamato and yeah. that long horizontal thing across the top. That's, that's the, the range fighter. fighter. Yeah. So that huge long thing is the whole width of the boat. Yeah. And then the second image is an optical diagram for a periscope yeah. that Nippon Kugaku had made for, I guess, a submarine. Yeah. And it has 29 elements yeah. in it. Jesus. But well, you know what ha- what's funny is, like I said, Fukeda was on the, on the team that designed those range fighters. And the prisoners were, were ground to seconds as opposed to minutes. That's how accurate they were. And years later, 
that technology was used to design the prism for the Nikon F. Because hmm. he had worked with prisms so much during the war. When he went to design the prism for the Nikon F, he went back on his knowledge of prisms and he, he came up with the Nikon F. And it was it was MacArthur's decision to allow Nippon Kangaku to continue producing optics based on that performance, right? Yes. Well, the thing is, after the war, all the companies that were involved with the military were, were put on on in, in a bad position, okay? MacArthur and the boys, they wanted to shut them all down, okay? Now, Nikon was the number one optical manufacturer in World War II. They had 22 factories going during the war. And they didn't make anything for commercial use except for before the war with Canon. But everything they made was military, period. After the war, MacArthur and the boys, they wanted everybody to get involved in making things that could be exported and could be sold to get cash flow into the country and, and sign democratizing. So Nikon petitioned GHQ for the right to acquire raw materials to make certain things. Well, they wouldn't talk to Nikon for a while because Nikon was a military company. They were founded by an admiral. Okay, They've been military their whole life. And they couldn't get on the list to get the raw materials. They couldn't get chromium, things like that. Finally, their president was a fellow by the name of Nagoka, who spoke perfect English. He was a doctor. He spoke perfect English. He was educated in the United States. He finally was able to write the, the letters the correct way. He was finally able to meet with, with MacArthur and the boys. And he convinced them that Nikon would make just civilian products. And it would be highly high quality stuff, of course, because they made military stuff. But still, they were cut down to two factories from 22. Wow. Almost all of their machinery had already been mothballed, already been mothballed. You know where it was going? Their entire selection of lathes and all grinding, all the big machinery they used to make all that stuff during the war was going to Chiang Kai-shek uh -huh. in China for war reparations. It was already mothballed. It was ready to go. 1,200 pieces were going to go to Chiang Kai-shek. And the Goku is begging with them not to do this because they couldn't make anything if this stuff was taken from them. So finally, MacArthur backed off. Chiang Kai-shek never got him. They stayed put. And then, you know, they went down to two factories and uh, like 1,200 people from 24,000 during the war. They had to, went down to 1,200. Right there in Shinagawa, which is the south end of the southern part of, of Tokyo, so in the south side of Tokyo, was not hit very much during the war. As a matter of fact, they survived the war in pretty good shape, considering what happened to the rest of Tokyo. But um, they almost didn't exist. In 47, 46 and 47, they were that close to going under. As a matter of fact, they were so poor, they had no heat in the wintertime. I got pictures of Fukeda working at his, at his drawing desk in the wintertime with gloves on. He yeah, didn't have any yeah. heat. Cold. Okay? Uh, all right. They were cold. If they would have an order for 10 cameras, they would build the 10 cameras. Okay? Then they'd send all the workers home and call them up when they got another order for more cameras. They couldn't afford to have them there every day. They'd wait till they get another order for maybe eight or 10 cameras, and they'd call them back, and they'd come back, and they'd make those. That's They were living day-to-day, -day, period, day-to-day. -day. But you know what saved them? The one product that saved them? Revere Camera Company in Chicago. Amazing. Made little eight millimeter movie cameras, which came with a 13 millimeter, what, one nine or something? Little yeah. tiny lens, about big as your thumb, right? Yep. 22,000 of them <laughs> were sold to Revere at $7 a piece. Wow. That's how, but that saved the company. At seven bucks, they were still making money out, but they sold 22,000 wow. of the Revere camera right here in Chicago. And that's what saved Nikon after the war. That was the first product that was a success. I remember you told me that story, Bob, because I, I've seen those lenses. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. Yeah, the camera, you can still find them really there's easily. thousands of them out there. Yeah, and some, are, are. some are even marked Occupied Japan, if you look real yeah. close. I had a couple that were marked Occupied Japan. Wow. But the camera that they put them on, Revere had a whole series of eight, those little eight millimeter, they weighed like yeah. a ton. They were solid cast iron, right? Okay. Yeah. It was called the B2, I think it was. The B2 model was the one that came with the Nikkor lens. They charged like an extra 10 bucks for it or whatever. They were paying wow. seven for them. They charged an extra 10 or $12 for the camera if you got it with the Nikkor lens, you know. Then later on, Sears copied them when they, when they took it, brought in all the Nikon lenses for the tower cameras. But that little lens, that little lens saved Nikon. Rob, um, or anybody listening, if you want to learn more about Nikon, Nippon Kugaku's role uh, before and during the war, on my website, I have an article that I reprinted with permission by this guy named Dr. Jeffrey Alexander, um, who is, uh, he did a master's thesis called yes, I remember him. Nikon and the Sponsorship of Japan's Optical Industry by the Imperial Japanese Navy. Long title, but it's a really, really in-depth look at what they were doing back then and what their role was in the war and everything, you know, leading up to it, like supporting what, what Robert said. It's, I think it's a great read. If, if There's another good read out there. It was, it was written by a friend of mine called Wes Loader. Uh, it's called Nikon in America. 
1947 to 1951 or 52. You got a copy there? I helped Wes write it. I did the introduction for it and whatever. But Wes is a trained librarian. He came up with an idea that I had never thought of. Because I, like I said, I went to the public library trying to find information. They couldn't get anything out of Japan or whatever. So what does Wes do? He goes to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. And he knew who SCAP was. SCAP was the, the MacArthur Boys, okay? It was called SCAP. And he started looking up Nippon Kagaku and the, and the Nikon and also the Japanese optical industry and whatever. And he came up with all kinds of information about what was being made, how mess was being made, when it was being made, where it was being sold, of all the companies, not just Nikon, but of all the companies. But he it's a it's a very detailed book. Now, it's, it's an ap- academic press, so it's not something you're going to find anywhere. You might find them in a bigger library somewhere. But it's called The Nikon in America. And uh, it's, it's a very good, he writes very well. It's very easy to follow. It's highly technical in some respects, but you have to read it if you want to really know what happened it's a good right book. after the war. Yeah. Andre, it sounded like at one point you were going to ask a question. Did you have one? Uh, no, it wasn't specifically a, a question. And, you know, apologies to, to single him out like this. But I, I just want to say how, how great it is to see Johnny's face again. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to tell you the same thing. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, you know we we have to share a little a little camera porn here. Although you know, <clears throat> it, it's not quite film. Uh, I have here my my new to me Nikon ZFC, and uh, just to kind of lean very much into the the old school FM FE uh, aesthetics, I went ahead and on the on the back of the screen <laughs> taped a little Cinestill BWXX. <laughs> nice. You know, rep, repping the double X, repping Cinestill, and uh, the the modern interpretation of this weird, delightful little digital camera. The first digital camera that I've owned in, I mean, going on almost ten years now. Yeah, I have the Z5, and um, I wanted to get a like a prime lens for it, so I settled on the forty f two the Nikkor Z, but they, they make two versions of that lens. They make the regular one and then they make one that's cosmetically. Yeah. It's like that. That's it right there. They they're making lenses that look like the old AIS, yeah. you know, they're, they're functionally, functionally the same, but they kind of have that look. Although I am still very angry that they did not put a physical aperture ring on this. Yeah. Yeah. You can assign this quote, quote unquote control ring to do you know, focus by wire or change your aperture or exposure compensation. But Nikon, you were so close. Why don't yeah. you just put a manual <laughs> aperture ring on there? Oh, anyway, the it's been a lot put of the fun. bunnies on there. Come on, put the bunnies <laughs> on there. Yeah, just screw them in. You know why that camera was such a success? Because everybody got tired of looking at all these black blobs that look like jelly beans, okay? I mean, the yeah. cameras they make today, they all look alike. You can't yeah. tell them apart till you see the name on it. And this camera, even though it's retro, is a much more handsome camera than the stuff that's coming off the lines now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. and, and you know, I, I still, having owned it now for a little over a month, do I love shooting digital? Not really. But uh, for scanning my film, it's been working great. Yeah, I played around with the video a little bit. And I just love the fact that it aesthetically fits in with everything else that I own. And people can poo-poo like, oh, did you buy the camera just for the looks? Yeah, god damn it. I did. Yeah. It feels, right. it, looks it feels cool. right in my hands. It feels right in my hands. Uh, it, it looks, you know, like everything else. And there is a disarming effect to something like this versus any of these black modern mirrorless cameras with a big old honking lens on the front of it. Yeah. Nobody has given a shit about me shooting this this camera on on the street. They just think I'm one of these young film hipsters yeah. and I'm okay to, to blend in with that uh with that demographic yeah well the aesthetics that's what drew me to fuji originally my first yeah. mirrorless was the fuji xt20 and while it's it doesn't look like a nikon but it has mechanical dials with actual yeah. click stops and it looks like somebody cared about the design you know for so many years cameras were toyota camrys yeah and yeah. now they're starting to look cool again you know yeah. mm-hmm. and i i don't know how well this is doing for them sales wise but man I, I hope I hope that it catches on. There's there's an actual collector's group in Tokyo for that camera. I know the guy that's running. His name is Damie Tanaka. It's an actual collector's group and users group for that camera specifically. So that's it, awesome. it's a hit over there. Yeah. Well, I, I, as a testament to the to the to Nikon and the, the you know especially after the war, I don't know how old this lens is, but I've tested about thirty or thirty five lenses on the GFX 
um, body and my very favorite manual lens, not, not of the, not of the modern ones, but my very favorite vintage lens is this, which is an icon lens. <laughs> and this is for a bro. Is this the is Bronica? for a bro not, maybe Bronica. Yeah, it's, it's for the Bronica, the one that you can pull pull yeah. the, uh, the yeah. teleport out on. Yeah, that's and yep. the, the render. This is also one of Perry's favorite lenses. He he gassed Nick Lyle into it. Nick gassed me into it, and I gassed Hong Jun Lee into it. This it's, lens is fabulous on the GFX. Get it's them for like eighty bucks. Yeah. they're hard to adapt, but if you can if you can figure out how to how to stack the adapters to it, the render yeah. is amazing. And they're they're cheap. I mean they're. Because it's the S two is a it's a Veronica's orphan. gone. They're gone. The bodies are all gone. Yeah, yeah it, it, right, exactly. So it's it, you can still find them cheap. And they made a whole series of lenses. Uh, I used to have them. They they made a forty, which was fabulous. They made a fifty. Uh, they made that lens. They made a a one o a one a one o five. I think with a with a with a uh, leaf yeah. shutter in it. So you could use yeah. like a Hasselblad if you wanted to. You know, mm -hmm. they made them all the way up to. Uh, 500. I, I would caution people listening if you want to adapt that. Lens. I mean, they're really, it's a cheap lens and it, it, it's just beautiful. It is. But you've got to get the right one because some of the helicoids are integral to the body. So you've got to get one that comes with later, a little bit later. Yeah. The real early ones are different. Real early ones are different. Yeah. The guy that came up with that, he got, he had something like a hundred and some patents were granted to him for that camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was like Zenza Burrow, I think. Zenza, was he name. did it all by himself. He did yeah, it all by huh? himself. Yep. So, Bob, why why did Nikon make this lens for Bronica? Like, the, I mean, I I don't know what year this was. I'm assuming this is fifty, like fifties. Fifty seven. They started fifty seven. Yeah. They made all of Bronica's lenses up until uh, finally at the end, that Bronica decided to make some of their own. They called them Zenzanons. But Nikon mm -hmm. made all of their lenses from the beginning, from the very first Bronica, all the way up until uh, like when the EC came out. And then they started to see the Zenzanon lenses coming out. Nikon and and, and uh, Bronica just had a very good relationship. You know, uh, Zenzo Bron, Zenzo, Zenzo, whatever his name was, he knew the the president, or whatever of Nikon, and he needed lenses. He, he wasn't a lens maker; he was a camera maker. So he went to Nikon, and they made a whole series of lenses for him. Now, is the quality of those? I, I only have this one lens, but yeah. I know that the range of them is the quality on all of them. The wides up to the helis, up to snuff, to 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 what this. Most this of them, yeah. The, the the best one they had, uh, the forty was supposed to be very good. I did shoot with that. The fifty. They made a 53.5, then they, later on they made a 52.8, which is better. Uh, they made that lens, and then they went to the, the one with the leaf shutter in it. They had a 135, which was so-so. They had a 200, which was very good. One of the last lenses they came out for was, was a 350, which is very sharp. Then the lens, they also made an adapter to use the, the short mount lenses from the rangefinder series, the 180, the 250, the 350, the 500. And the, the 350 was actually made in direct Bronica mount for a while. So they they were really involved with Bronica quite a bit, and the stuff was good. Yeah, they they there's, the circle was was big enough to cover two and a quarter. That's all it had to be. That you're, you're, whatever they call it, circle confusion or something like that. All that stuff covered two and a quarter beautifully. So we're coming up on uh, two hours here. So one of the get it gone. Well, Bob, thanks for coming on. Um, yep. Before anybody else goes, so I wanted to real quick just go around the room and like, what have you guys been shooting lately? Are any any new pickups anybody's had? Uh, Rob. Yeah, baby. What is that? Hasselblad 500 CM with 135. Johnny gassed me into this. There's a, there's a picture on the Camerosity website. I did a, I did a self portrait that's up there. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was a good picture. It's very thought provoking. Andre. Besides the ZFC, uh, I just loaded up a roll of uh, some Kodak Ektachrome 100 in my Lomography Sprocket Rocket. I'm gonna be shooting that this weekend and uh, developing it in the Cinestill. D9 dynamic chrome to get some, uh, you know, some some extra highlight latitude out of that, given the fact that that shutter is a piece of crap um, and is likely going to overexpose uh, everything by at least half a stop. Right. Should be fun. Theo, what about you? I've actually uh, moved back up into the 4x5 realm for a little while now. So I've started shooting the Pressman. I'm starting to pull out a couple of the other 4x5 cameras and uh, and uh, I'm really enjoying that. And uh, I've been shooting the Super Conta 6 a lot, the 6x9, um, which uh, is a lot of fun. And the quality is just out of this world. So I'm really uh, quite enjoying those uh, larger formats at the moment. I was really impressed with the photos you got out of the Super Iconta. Yeah, on Cinestill 50D um, as well. And it is, they are tack sharp and the colors are just mind blowing. And now, was that a pre war or post war Super Iconta? It's the Super Iconta C, which is the 1930s. Okay. All right. Super underrated film, that, uh, that 50D. It doesn't get uh, enough love. Oh, I love that film, especially in a 
camera like the um, like that, which has got very limited shutter speeds. So yeah. you have to use a fairly sh uh, slow um, film in there, and uh, it just just sings. It's it's just superb. Make slow films great again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anthony, what about you? Well, after the half frame show, I went on to the Japanese eBay sector and ended up with a, a Pen D2. I've shot a couple of rolls through that, getting ready to load it up with uh, another roll this weekend. And other than that, you know, I just got to take out. Johnny, you probably missed the whole drama here. I traded every last bit of my Leica gear to Paul for a Fuji G617. Wow. So I, I no longer have my M3 or my 3F, but I do have wow. the uh, 617, which gets, of course, four shots per roll of 120. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I I took it out again last week and I'm just absolutely and enamored with shooting that camera. Nice. No bracketing. <laughs> no bracketing. And actually, no. you know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, since the first week I've had it, I've shot every shot handheld. Yeah. And there's no blur either. It's amazing. And no, and no fingertips. Yeah. OK. I know where he's going with this one. <laughs> <laughs> I posted a whole bunch. I have a no blacks. And uh, I shot a whole bunch of images on it. And even though I knew not to hold it so my fingers would show up in the image, my second roll, like half of the images, my fingers are still in the image. It's so hard to hold that camera without getting your fingers in there. Yeah, I have a Hologon and it actually has a hand grip because it's physically impossible to hold the camera without yeah. seeing your fingers in your images. So the no blacks, it's like you have to hold it with the very tips of your fingers, but it's this heavy you know swing lens camera so you want to stabilize it so it's like you're constantly fighting the urge to grip it but you get your image your fingers in there time to get one of these uh fancy schmancy gimbals that all the kids are using yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. the kids but anthony you you had the gas almost right away with that pen d2 right like, like the next day you bought it i, I did I, you know because it's funny how the show works is that i actually love these episodes that we do where we go and do a deep dive into like a make or a style because you know even though i'm a bit of a half frame fanatic i do not understand the history of the pin other than the two pin f's i don't understand the history of the pin half frame series from olympus there's just too many i'm too confused and finding out that i could get the, the d2 with that 1.7 uh lens uh mm -hmm. for 115 dollars shipped from japan I was like, next morning, I was all in on it. And it, somehow it, it arrived from, from Osaka to Gainesville in three days. He got that debt camera from Japan 4,000 times faster than it took him to get Theo's camera uh, from Australia. <laughs> and it and didn't it, even sit on the side of the road. Yeah, what, yeah. what the hell? Um, yeah. Well, it's funny. I, You know, we always talk about people getting gas after one of our episodes. But the half frame one, I think, evoked a lot of gas. Uh, you know, you got a camera. Ray Nason just posted that he ordered an AGAT 18. I think everyone did. Yeah, a lot of people did. <laughs> Anthony, though, Anthony didn't, even though that's the one he still wants to get. I know. Get. I know. <laughs> oh, but there's a run on them now, Anthony. They're going to be I expensive. I know. <laughs> So Johnny gassed me into an Olympus pen a couple of years ago. And I, I hear, pe you know how people say on the half frames that it just takes forever to get through a roll. I've got some advice because I don't actually have that issue, but I do, a, I do a thing, which is every time I take a shot, I do a diptych, like I do two shots. And when I think that way, I wind up going through a roll the same, at the same speed that I go through a normal, normal roll. So what you take a picture of something and then take a picture of something. Every right time I it? take a picture on my pen, I look for two pictures to take. So I go pop. Okay. And pop. Rob, that's exactly what what I do. If I wanted to shoot a format smaller than thirty five millimeter, I mean, I wouldn't do that to begin with. But it, it, I already struggle enough with thirty six exposure. So yeah, I when I'm shooting half frame, I'm looking for the diptych and composing with that yeah. in mind. And I'll, I'll I'll see something and I'll wait until perhaps on the way back. I'm like, all right. I'm totally. going to go back and have to do those together in sync. Um, speaking of half frame, actually, I don't know if, if anybody has gotten a chance to try the little, I mean, probably made in China Kodak Ektar H35. We talked about it, but we, but not think anybody had shot one. These are not crap. I was really, really pleasantly surprised. I mean, you have the same kind of low-ish quality reusable disposables that we see a bajillion of these days. But two of the things that I love about this thing are A, the viewfinder is probably just, you know, some stock part that they've been shoving in all the other dis reusable disposables uh, made in China. But in the viewfinder, because you're 
you know, shooting a, a vertical format, they actually just place two kind of uh, pieces of plastic to the left and right, and they're perforated so that you can see through them when you're having like an infinity, you know, target focused uh, look. So they're acting kind of sort of like frame lines so that you can see what's beyond your frame through that perforated little screen, um, which I thought was neat. And the other thing, I don't know what kind of like two cents more expensive capacitors they put in this thing, but it charges up the flash incredibly quickly and it retains the charge even overnight. Something that I've never gotten any of these kind of El Cheapo little reusable disposables uh, to do. So the combination of those things um, and just using it in situations, you know, benefit well from no control over exposure and shooting with the diptych in mind. I've had so much fun with this camera in the past oh. few days. And again, on the topic of aesthetics, if you pick the girly mint color, people take it less seriously than the same thing looking black looks more, I'm not going to say pro, but people are more suspicious of it yeah. than the, you know, pastel mint green <laughs> does it come in pink probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i fully throw in my my support for the, okay. the kodak ektar h35 half frame camera it makes a great gift a stocking stuffer emulsive secret santa gift this year a plus very cool well, you, you know when, when i'm shooting my half frames um i almost always just bulk load rolls of 12 so i'm getting 24 exposures just for me, I, that's like the perfect number of frames is 24, uh, especially when I'm just like playing around with the camera to see how it is. No, I like I like the 72. I like the 72. You yeah, just me too. Keep shooting. Yeah, yeah I, I always tell people um, when I was talking about half frames that you got to think about it like a sketch pad. It's not you're not meant to ponder on half frame stuff. You're supposed to just fire it. You're supposed to just shoot it, you know, so just look and shoot, look and shoot, look and shoot. And I. I, I I always found that to be the the funnest part about shooting half frame. Although I say that, what I would do when I shot diptychs is I wouldn't usually pair them up right away. I'd shoot one thing, make myself remember the thing that I shot, and then try to find something that completely different that I thought would work with it. So two really different things. But I mean, it made me that half frame. It makes me think more, or it makes me think less. Right. Um, both of those things both apply. I think the half frame. Paul, what are you shooting? Oh, I'm knee deep in hustle bloods right now. <laughs> That's so, right. You did say that. Yeah, I got that kit with four lenses, and you, the 50 millimeter lens was hanging up at one second, and the 250, the depth of field preview didn't work, which would not be a big deal at all, except I want to use it on the Sony too, and so I can't stop it down. So yeah. those have both gone out for repairs. So I'm shooting with the 80 and the 150 right now. So, Paul, did I get the right lens here on this? Did you get the 135? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great lens. That and the 60 or two that I really want to find. Yeah. For me, um, nothing terribly interesting. Uh, Pre-war, though, I, I have a Certo Delina 3. Um, I've shot multiple Delinas before. I really like these because the focusing knob moves the plane. It's on the top of the camera. Range finder, um, uncoated Zeiss Tessar lens. But it, I always like uncoated pre-war lenses and shooting color through them because it, it just gives the colors that slight tinge it's slightly more muted not quite as vibrant um but it always has a distinct look of pre-war lenses and then um the other one is this uh fujika st801 i posted a question in the chicago camera collectors group um i was at the uh, photorama show last september uh rob i think i saw you we went to vlad's house I met Christopher May at the show. I didn't know like him at the time, but he gifted me this Fujika and I just flaked out and forgot who had given it to me. I'm like, shit, I should have written that down. And then I posted something today and said, who was it that gave me this camera? He goes, it was me. <laughs> and uh, this thing is really, really nice. I mean, I've shot a couple other Fujika SLRs before. I've shot the 901. I've shot the 705. I've shot, um, what is it? The ATX or something it's called. And I, I think this one's my favorite. It, it uses a, a match LED metering in the viewfinder. It's got incredibly bright view screen. It's screw mount, but it uses the EBC Fujinon lenses. It's one of the only ones in, in terms of aesthetic. The Fujika logo is in chrome, you know, above the prism. 
it just it, it gives a kind of a nice touch to it and the camera feels like i'd compare it to like a nikon fe maybe in terms of build quality it's probably from that same era and of course the lenses are good too so i've been really really liking this camera i'm shooting it now for a review but i could i could tell this is something i'd probably come back to in the future i mentioned i was shooting this right the pathfinder the other ca the, in anticipation that i was coming on the show uh, another camera that I almost bought and I thought I would uh, just throw out there for people's opinions on it because I very well could have been holding that one up right now as well. Somebody at Central Camera came in to sell, one of the things they were selling was a uh, Graflex XL super wide. You know, I'm a sucker for anything that will do super wide or pano, of course. So I was looking at this thing and I, I was like, I, I don't buy equipment anymore. I just don't, period. But I was looking at this thing and I even talked to Rob about it because I was like, man, I think I want to get this camera. I don't know. So I, I looked at it and then I looked at, you know, I read some stuff about it and I I, I took a lot of things in consideration. I ended up passing on it um, partially because of that plastic weird lens mount, which I was only ever going to shoot the 65. I was never going to change the lens. I was going to leave the super wide super wide on there all the time. So that's not really an issue. But the other issue that I heard a lot about was film flatness with the Graflex backs. You know, I don't mind some funky stuff, but if I'm going to shoot, if I'm going to bother shooting on 120, I actually do want it to be sharp and not out of focus and curled, right? So I ended up passing on it, just thinking about the, was the camera going to hold up and did I want to deal with any film flatness issues? I don't know if you guys have shot one of those or have opinions about it, but I thought I would ask, there's a chance I could still get this camera. I think I've made up my mind. I don't want it. Um, but those are my two big questions about it. I've not shot one, but I've relieved my desire for one uh, based on what I'm seeing from uh, Steve over at Chroma. I mean, the stuff that he's doing is uh, pretty neat, relatively inexpensive. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really want that as like a party camera. I wanted to love the... Lomography um, LCA 120, but I want to be able to control right. everything. So yeah. having a super wide lens that can focus up close, that I can throw in a little shoulder bag and put a flash on it and control everything is is on my long term wish list. And I'm I'm cautiously, you know, taking a peek at what Steve is working on because I don't necessarily want to throw a good bit of dough at something like the XLSW and run into issues like that myself. Yeah, the, the lens isn't quite wide enough, I don't think. The, I, I have both the uh, Plob L69W Pro Shift, mm -hmm. which is a 47 Super Angulon on uh, 6x9, and also I have a Mamiya Super 23 with the 50 millimeter and the 6x9, and those are both, I, I recommend either of those two. Okay. I mean, it's just, it's just enough wider that... Uh, uh, you get more bang for your buck, and it's certainly a lot more reliable than that Graflex would be. And and I remember the the, the, Graf, the Graflex came up in our Graflex show that we had, and if I'm remembering correctly, that plastic lens mount has not held up well. No, the, the little nubs that break off, and when they break off, you're done. Yeah, there's nobody's going to be able to repair it. Right? Even if you're not changing lenses, they're just they're they're getting brittle. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was my, that was the big decider for me. Cause I don't, I mean, just as a rule, I don't get into any camera stuff anymore. If it's not repairable, I just don't. It, to me, it's, it's just not, I mean, it's fun to screw around with, but I don't want to invest any money in it. You know? Yeah. I, I'll go the other way and, and surprise everybody by saying my favorite wide angle camera. And um, it also does panoramics is I'm shocked. The, the Mamiya 7. The Mamiya 7. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but uh, I think everyone's heard enough about that in <laughs> previous episodes. So one last question for Johnny. We're coming up on a year since Central reopened after the fire. So how how's business been? Is Don is Don doing well? Um, it's a very much a struggle. Is right it? Now, to be quite honest, yeah, it is. It's I don't know what the future holds. Are so you not seeing the same amount of traffic as you did yeah, prior to 2020? The world has changed. I mean, there's still students down there doing photography, but the amount of people in the loop every day is significantly less. There's significantly less foot traffic. I mean, we still have the dedicated people coming in to do, you know, film developing and all that, 
But I mean, it's just, you know, we lost a lot of core business and the landlord's a mother. He's a complete mother. So it's very possible Central will not exist because the Paul who owns the building has no, he's a, he's a completely clueless. So he has no idea how to be a landlord. He also has no idea what Central is and doesn't care. So it's, you know. It, he, I don't know if the he will even have a lease after August. I mean, I hate to be doom and gloom, but I just I don't know what the future holds, and business is very touchy right now. That's disappointing to hear. Yeah, so I, I actually one of the things I want to try to do is get the sign landmarked before partially to screw the building owner, <laughs> because if he ends up having to deal with the city of Chicago for a landmarking issue, he's completely f- <laughs> so. Part of me wants to just get the the neon sign landmark so that nobody can with it it's just really hard to do that in chicago so. well if any listeners of the camerosity podcast know <laughs> anything about landmarking in the city of chicago uh any dailies listening please call johnny sisson <laughs> yeah <laughs> any valiant public servants wanting to yeah. do a good deed <laughs> yeah 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 it's worth asking. I mean, put the word out, you know, I mean, you, you never know what might happen. My wife works for the city. So I, you know, I've sort of asked her about, about it. She has no idea who the people are that do landmark stuff, but it's a fairly prominent thing in Chicago and it's enough of a, oh, yeah. yeah. And it's enough. And it's actually the building itself is, is interesting. We used to have among the various people who used to come into central sort of on, on a regular basis, there was a guy who was an architecture professor, I think from, I want to say like IIT or something. And he used to come in every year with a tour group and into the central camera, not because it was a camera store, but because the building itself, um, the way that the space is, anybody who's ever been in there, the the ceiling is like 32 feet high. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's yeah. an insane space. So basically he used to come in with a group and talk about how this building when it was built, had these enormously high ceilings. And there was some architectural significance to that as well. It's a, it's an interesting space. It always has been. But I think that there's probably multiple reasons it might be interesting to the city as a landmark. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> All right. Well, keep us posted. You know, Johnny, it's not just Chicago. Even in, in little old Gainesville, uh, after the pandemic, uh, so many of the downtown tech companies stayed remote. Oh you know, yeah, we we have lost so much of our like. I mean, we we've we've had to find different traffic because we we we've lost about twenty five percent of our daily traffic of our regulars, I and we it. we've been able to build that back with new customers. But those those tech workers that we had, they just never came back. Yeah, uh, my day job is for a software company, and we're the same way. I mean, we still work from home. Our company downtown. I mean, t- talk foot traffic for 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 Central. Like our company has maybe fifteen percent of the people come in. Yeah. 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 Starting January of next year, I'll be working remote for Cine still as well. Yeah. I mean, in Chicago, downtown, you know, you see it everywhere downtown. It's just people, it, it's, it, there's not a lot of logic behind forcing people to commute an hour each way into the city every day to do their work when they can do it at home, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's not just Chicago. Yeah. It's, it's everywhere. So that's sad, sad to hear. But uh, I think that's a good point to end the show here. Maybe not on a downer. Let's think of something funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got Johnny on a show. So that's it's pretty what, awesome. Two years? Yeah. It's <laughs> you, been a did while. You do, you have, do you have photos of something? Well, part of it is, you know, we record on Mondays usually. And, and Johnny, you said that it's that's just a horrible day for him. Yeah. Part of it is, you know, you guys know that I have small children and it's harder for me to find time to do this too. So we kind of have to work with different schedules, different people, but uh, we do try to stay flexible. I was just throwing out there. We haven't done a Euro episode in about a year now. Um, and we've had some awesome listeners in Germany and Italy and Belgium that have been on previous shows too, that we love talking to this episode. I knew it'd be the 50th episode and I wanted to get Johnny back on. I begged him, I pleaded him, you know, and, and he agreed to come. So thank you, Johnny, for showing us. Uh, uh, hopefully it won't take uh, to episode 100 before you'll come back again. It's always yep. great to hear you. You have great stories. I really, really, really want to talk to your dad. I, hear yeah. those stories too. I'll talk to him about it. I'd love to get him on and get, because I I want to record his stories too. I mean, sure. you know. I love hearing these stories. That's what I want to hear us about. Um, for the next episode, we're going to do Kodak. Um, I've talked to Do- Todd Gustafson from the George Eastman House. 
He's oh, cool. agreed to come back on the show. He was on one of the other ones, but we just didn't feature him. So we're going to talk about trying to pick apart the confusing array of Kodak cameras, uh, which ones are the ones to go after. You know, Anthony and I both love the medalist, but, you know, there's other ones out there that are worth collecting too. We have some great ideas for future shows beyond that. But like I say, every episode, the whole appeal to this show from the very beginning, Johnny and I said, we're going to make a show without planning a whole lot. Uh, maybe throw a topic out there and just see where it goes. I didn't even know Bob Rodoloni was coming tonight. So <laughs> had he not been here, this whole episode would have been totally different. And that's what I love about the show is just you just never know what, what we're going to talk about. I'm only disappointed because in the chat, Paul wanted to talk about King Regula and we never got a, we never got around to it. So yeah. We'll just kick that one down the road as well. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for showing. You guys have a good night, and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Good night. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Bye, everyone. From the great Midwest, it is Cocaine and Waffles. (laughs) The ultimate camera chat podcast featuring none other than Johnny Sisson and Mike Ackman. All right. Okay. Says you. you, you. It is recording now. So it's saving local to this this machine. I'll just send you the file when it's done. But do you want me to try recording it here too? Uh, You can try. As a backup. It says, please ask the host to give you permission. Let's see. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. It's always good to have a backup, just in case. Okay. There we go. Okay, you are both a co-host, and you should be able to record. Yeah, it looks like it's going now. All right, so it says Cheyenne is in the meeting, but both his video and audio are off. So we use use Zoom every day at my work for... Can you hear me? Hey, there he is. Yeah, sorry, guys. Hang on. Like, yeah, I'm like, this is the first time I've used Zoom, okay? Oh, okay. I know, like, pandemic and everything. I've got to <laughs> look terrible. What's up, Mad Max? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you I'm know, good, buddy. How are you? I, I can't confirm this because I haven't seen the movie in years, but I, I think I read that the original Mad Max was set in the year 2021. Yeah. I think that that's sounds true. good. I actually, I actually worked on... Uh, the first Mad Max, I was uh, assistant armorer. So I did all the weapons and explosives. <laughs> and uh, we did the filming in the outback. And it, it was like, it was fucking crazy, man. It was so much fun. There was all these <laughs> mental actors. And uh, the after party was like um, on this cliff overlooking the desert. It, it, it was like, it was totally fucking wicked. Oh, no. Nice. You hear me? I can hear you great. Awesome. And you know, Cheyenne brings up something that we haven't discussed. I, I fully uh, allow uh, curse words in this podcast. We are <laughs> oh, not. I we are not. We are, well, because Simon would always sen- Simon would censor him out. So I, I feel like we should embrace uh, foul language. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, because like I'm an Australian man, I can't help it. Um, That's okay. That's okay. Anyway, like I'm, I'm not the only person that uses like curse words. Not pointing <laughs> fingers at anybody. <laughs> So real quick, we haven't, we are technically recording now, but we're, we're, so what we're going to do, you know, all this video, we're not going to use it. The video is just for us right now. Right. Uh, but we're just, we're just going to, we're going to post the, the, we're going to post the audio. Johnny's going to edit it. He's got a short intro uh, that he's already recorded. We won't hear it on this. So uh, we're going to get started, I guess. There's no reason to wait. But it's fucking epic. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, this is all like a secret squirrel business. Like, wh- what's the story? Like, this is well, like, the, the story is, is the story is the classic lenses podcast. The episodes are starting to get few and far between. And I had reached out to Johnny and said, hey, man, you know, if you just want me to jump in every once in a while, like, I don't need to be a special guest, like just have somebody else in there. Right. To- to interject new conversation and he loved the idea, but like it never happened, you know? And then um, like last week he's like, dude, let's do a podcast. You know, I'll, I'm not even telling the guys you're going to come um, and you just be there. And I was like, Oh, okay. That's cool. Like we'll literally start recording and, and I'll just appear. 
Right. It, we thought it was a fantastic idea, but Johnny had me sitting there. I mean, it wasn't Johnny's fault, but for an <laughs> hour, felt so bad <laughs> for an hour while Simon was dicking around with his audio. And I don't know what the hell he did. Like how hard is it to record a podcast? But apparently he could not get it to work at all. Right. And after an hour, they just gave up. So like he lost, he lost my podcast. I did like a really awesome yeah. podcast. He, he I mean, lost it. I did yeah. it all over again. Right. I'm not trying to dog on Simon because I, I get that this can be difficult sometimes, but it seems like audio issues have really plagued him. And, and there was that one where Johnny sounded like he was a squirrel or something where you were yeah, at like that, one and oh, a half yeah, speed. That was terrible. That was, I love that. I, I want to <laughs> do that again. Okay. Real quick. Do do you, uh, Johnny, you want to do like the, what we're going to say for the intro then? Um, or do you want to record that part later and just add it in? I'm just giving you guys. I'm just giving you guys a heads up to interrupt. I'm. I'm actually at work. I'm at a okay. client's house. Are the clients <laughs> left? So if he comes back, I'm gonna have to cut it short. I'll right. say. I'll just say, hey, sorry, I got, I got to run, guys. It's urgent, and oh, you'll know that. Yeah, you just back, you get, you peace out on us. That's fine. That's. Cool. I'm picturing like Walter White in Breaking Bad, where like he yeah. says he's fumigating a house, but he's actually making meth. Yeah, totally. <laughs> hey, he's well. Meth's involved, uh, but he's not making it. <laughs> Here's a sound bite for you, John. <laughs> All right, real quick. So, yeah, just jump out whenever you want. I mean, I, I envision this being something people come and go. Uh, we, let's just get started. Uh, you'll, John, you'll do your, um, your yeah, intro I'll, later. I'll do, I'll do it when we, when we start. Uh, just because, I, because apparently nobody except you and me knows what this is called. So right. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait until we start okay, everyone's here fine. and then I'll, and then I'll do the intro. Yeah, I'm like this, like pretend I I don't know because I don't so, know. So yeah, let's just go ahead and just record. So we'll, and we'll you can yeah. yeah we'll start and I'll just pretend like you're just joining and then yeah. you could say hi or something. Yeah. So don't don't yeah. say anything until I, I say oh look Cheyenne's here. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, all right, so like this is the point like beep where you'll start editing. Yeah. <laughs> oh you mean like right now you want to start now are we, are well, we have other well, i mean it's jump? already recording but like when you play this back later this will be the point where you splice in or oh, whatever okay. all right the, the, everything from this point forward was Is, uh okay was just you wanna, banter you want to do it we can do it now do you want to start all right so we're uh, gonna start I, I, I didn't know if anybody else was joining us at the very beginning here i told people some people i told 8 30 some people i said wait 15 okay. minutes that way we don't have like eight people jumping in all at the same time yeah cool all right great so i think that'll well, hope, can, if, we'll, if it works out the way i hope we'll have different people pop in and out at different times okay so all right all right, right we're gonna get started all right we're ready so i'll start out by saying boy i love that song <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey john how you doing all right so uh, we're here together to Wait, uh, the I, what? I, I'll do the actual intro then. You want to do the actual intro? Oh yeah, do that. I'll do the actual intro. Okay, okay go ahead.